a lot of the time your brown faces are lost in a sea of white but when there's a, a large group of brown faces represented it brings me so much joy you know like with october being black history month and um, lgbt history month being in february a lot of people only utilize those times in that month to highlight actually what they are doing for those individuals during that time and actually it should be 365 days a year, seven days a week that these communities are represented, not just over an awareness month that has its benefits, but also the point of those awareness months is to ensure that people are continuing to be accountable throughout the rest of the year. The Pride for me in 2020 has meant resilience and it has really highlighted the strength within the communities but also where we could also improve our relationships with one another. My name is Makinda Singh Chahal, and my preferred pronouns are he and him, and I'm the Senior Health Promotion Worker at Trade Sexual Health in Leicester, and also the Group Facilitator for Dorsti Leicester, which is a South Asian and Middle Eastern LGBTQ social and support group, hosting online and in-person socials as an opportunity for LGBTQ people to interact with one another and get to know one another. To say, for example, within the Gurdwara, I might not identify as a gay man, but I identify more as a Sikh within that space, solely because the surroundings determine what my identity is. That's not to say, that's not to say I am ashamed of my identity as a gay man within that space, but I understand that my identity as a Sikh overrides the, um, the importance within that particular space. Now, when it comes to engagement within the wider South Asian community, for example, I wear my label as a gay man very proudly because I understand the idea of visibility being crucial to understanding and accepting wider communities and individuals within those spaces. So although sometimes I may feel threatened by having the identity in uh, very prominent in those particular spaces, I know the greater good it would be for educating the wider community, but also empowering those individuals who may not feel that their identity can be represented in those spaces. You can use examples of, uh, you know, pride events or pride parades where, you know, a lot of the time your brown faces are lost in a sea of white, but when there's a, a large group of brown faces represented, it brings me so much joy to see those spaces being dominated by people of colour because actually they deserve to have that space more than anybody else and a lot of the time people of colour are putting their you know their identities which they can't hide because it's a part of our skin on the line to empower others but also to educate and let people know that we are there and we're not ashamed to be there either. I think for too long many organisations or many companies haven't been accountable for the actions that they take and you know some of the um, using of communities or appropriation of communities that they have used for their own profit or their own benefit. And I think, you know, understanding and accepting when things have not gone the right way in the past or when they have done something wrong, putting their hands up and owning up to it, but also laying out and laying on the line what they are going to do to then support those individuals that have, they have profited from going forward and how they can actually work together and collaboratively instead of just being a voice for them, utilising the voices of those individuals to in, empower others. As much as we can do, we should be lifting each other up as well as, as, well as acknowledging our own prejudices and the own downfalls within our wider communities. And, you know, identifying as a South, a South Asian person, I understand that there's a lot of anti-blackness within the South Asian community. And instead of just putting our hand over the sand and denying its existence, it's about challenging others, educating one another about why that is wrong and supporting one another going forward and supporting our 
um, the black community as much as we can. I think especially during the time of COVID, it has really highlighted the, the, the importance of community and cross-community resilience when, when supporting one another and each of our causes. I know it's almost, it feels like a broken record kind of element where, you know, a lot, some steps are taken, but then some steps are taken back, or some people only highlight what they're doing over certain times of the year. You know, like with October being Black History Month and um, LGBT History Month being in February, a lot of people only utilise those times in that month to highlight actually what they are doing for those individuals during that time. And actually, it should be 365 days a year, seven days a week that those communities are represented, not just over an awareness month that has its benefits, but also the point of those awareness months is to ensure that people are continuing to be accountable throughout the rest of the year. So it is starting, and I'm, I've definitely started to see a lot of um, cross cross identity support. Um, especially with campaigns like South Asians for Black Lives. It's been really empowering to see that actually, you know, we are gaining traction on the ground to then support wider communities. The first thing is to not be afraid of our own feelings. I think a lot of the time, you know, with COVID, it has really highlighted people's pressure that they put on themselves to kind of like deal with the situation. Nobody really prepares you for a situation like COVID-19 or, you know, the lockdowns which have happened. We basically had to go in there with whatever resilience we have had prior to that. So basically being thrown in at the deep end and hoping for the best. Now, as we go into a second lockdown and people have kind of had an idea of what feelings they've had during that time, it's about re-tuning re in to your own emotions and own feelings and really understanding them. And if you, if you struggle to understand them, getting support from other people around you um, with the support mechanisms which are there through either friends, family, or even professional support through organisations which have been continuing to provide support throughout the time the lockdown has been going on. And self-care really being super important and understanding that everybody has their own ways of self-care and not everybody's ways of self-care is going to be the same. Although, you know, some methods of self-care may be more constructive or destructive, but it's about understanding how that fits for you. And then if it does swing one way or another, understanding how you can then readdress that balance once coming out of the other side. Within the South Asian community, there is still a lot of stigma around mental health. And also there's a lot of shame attached to mental health and actually you know being in tune with one's emotions and feelings is almost seen as um you know not a good thing when actually it's probably the most important thing during this time so even if you see somebody struggling within your family actually just reaching out to them and um, to to see how they're doing and even within the wider community you know and i think especially within space like i've already mentioned spaces already but say for for example, places of worship where you may have seen people there, but actually unsure how to reconnect with them is actually, you know, connecting with those spaces, if possible, to then see and to ensure that they are supporting the wider communities that access those spaces. And so it might be a case of just calling and checking in with people if they've got contact or maybe opening up a space for a very limited time and promoting that to ensure that actually, you know, people who maybe haven't got access to a smartphone or the internet, have still got a space to go to, even if for a, a limited period of time. So Pride for me in 2020 has meant resilience and it has really highlighted the strength within the communities, but also where we could also improve our relationships with one another and to support one another in more ways and as many ways as possible. But the main overriding thing for Pride in 2020 has been resilience and strength. What about future Prides? For future Prides, I wish to see the continuation of the lessons learned during this time and ensuring that no person is left behind and ensuring that everybody is represented in as many ways as possible as well as 
being accountable for our own actions and accountable for the actions of other people and holding people into check, making sure that, you know, we're looking after one another, keeping each other safe and um, making sure that everybody can stay as ha happy and as healthy as possible um, throughout the whole community. So I think for me this year, like it was sad that we couldn't get together physically and, you know, to embrace one, an uh, one another as people usually were during Pride and at Pride events and Pride parades. But at the same time, it really enabled us to create new connections and that we may have never done in person and, and really reach out to people within our own communities that we may have never reached out to before. And I know for me, you know, utilizing digital spaces for digital Pride events, like we had done in Leicester, really enabled people who had never accessed the Pride before to access maybe their first Pride for the first time in a way which they felt comfortable doing. For a lot of people, you know, attending their first Pride event, physical first Pride event, can be very overwhelming. And actually, even that we saw with individuals accessing virtual pride in Leicester, it acted as that, as that stepping stone to see what could be done and building up their self-confidence and building up their uh, resilience to be able to maybe attend their first pride in person one day. I feel there's a lot more that could be done to improve that relationship. And I know even within Leicester, being, you know, the, the the first minority majority city in the in the UK, if it doesn't if it's not happening here, how can it happen anywhere else? So we know there's a lot more work to be done. And um and that's not just expecting, you know, people of colour to engage with in pride events if they're there. If there's no representation of those individuals, why should you expect those individuals to attend? So it's it's a learning to get individuals and people of colour on board within those spaces, within the planning process, within the development stages of Pride to ensure that they are represented and other people around them are represented too. The, the one thing that I always say to people is, you know, is if, if you're thinking that there's no representation for you, be that representation. If you are empowered and if you feel confident enough to go out there and put your face or put your neck on the line to be that representation, it will pay off. And I've seen that kind of like where being, my, being visible myself and actually being out there both physically and on the digital space, just being me. People have approached me to, to speak to me about their own fears, their own concerns, about the multiple identities they have which they can relate to through me.